All right, so if you ask social psychologists what the, mes what the most important discovery in social psychology over the last maybe 20 years, odds are that they're going to tell you it's implicit attitudes and implicit biases, right? What we found is that even so people like me, for example, say, no, I'm not biased. I like, you know, I like black people as much as I like white people. I like women as much as, much as I like men, and I treat them in the same way, like in many sense. Uh, really deep down, I may be biased against minorities, right? That's supposed to be the most important discovery in social psychology over the last 20 years. And if that's true, that's quite a shocking finding. Right? So uh, what I want to do today is to discuss some of these uh, uh, findings, some of that body of research. And the way I'm going to be looking at that is by asking the following question. What kind of things are attitudes, right? So we talk of implicit attitudes, explicit attitude, but there's been very little work on the nature, on the ontology of these attitudes. And that's the question I'm going to be asking. So if you ask social psychologists and many philosophers of psychology, you get roughly the following picture. So people say things like, you know, I like black people and I treat black people the same way I treat white people. That's what they say, assertions. And these assertions are, are meant to be expressing a first attitude, an explicit attitude. It's explicit roughly for the time being because we have access to it, right? We can verbalize it. And again, the discovery is that in addition to this attitude, which is just a mental state right, that people have access to, there's another mental state in the back of their mind, which may be, for example, a negative attitude directed toward black people. So what I want to argue is that this picture is, in fact, deeply misguided. Right? I will try to convince you that's just not the right way to frame 20 years of research on attitude. Right? I think it's, a, it's a actually, by and large, a confused way of thinking about attitudes. So here's what I will try to be arguing in the next 50 minutes. I will try to be arguing that attitudes are not mental states. It's a wrong ontological category. And a fortiori is a not mental state. They can't be either implicit mental states or explicit mental states, right? So the implicit explicit distinction just does not apply to, to, to attitudes. What are they if they're not mental states? Well, I will be arguing that they are traits. So I will be taking that long notion from social psychology, trait introduced by Alport in the 1940s, and try to say, well, that's the right concept to think about attitudes. And I will explain what that means a bit later. So there's no such thing as implicit attitudes, right? Because there's no such thing as these mental states. Attitudes are not mental states. So there's no such thing as implicit attitudes. So you may be asking, what do people do when they say things? such as, for example, I like black people, I treat black people the way I treat white people. I don't do any differences between them. Now, that kind of speech act, I will be arguing, does many things for us. One of the function of this speech act is actually to express a mental state, which will see the judgment. But, but that mental state, as I will be arguing, just is not an attitude. Right? So that's the picture I will try to be defending. It may be a bit opaque by now, but much of the talk will be dedicated to make sense of that picture, to explain that picture. So here's the structure of the next 50 minutes. I will first say a few more words about the traditional picture. I will put some flesh on it. Then I will try to explain my opposite view about attitudes. Uh, section one and section two, I won't give you any arguments. It will just be fleshing out the contrast between the two positions. Then in section three, I will give you my argument for the trait picture against the traditional picture, which is the best explanation argument. And then if I've got time, but I doubt I have time, I'll uh, say a few things about objections and responses. Right? So the structure of the talk. So let's start with the traditional picture of attitude. The first thing to say is that when I talk about attitude, I do not talk about propositional attitudes, right? So when philosophers use the expression propositional attitude, what they have in mind are relations between individuals and propositions, things like beliefs, desires, for example, wishes and hopes. That's just not what I have in mind. The word attitude here is used to refer to what social psychologists mean when they use the word attitude. So what do social psychologists mean when they, when they use the word attitude? Roughly, as a first pass, 
they mean likings and dislikings. Right? So an attitude in this context is a liking and a disliking. It's a two-plus psychological relation between an entity that bears the attitude, either an individual or maybe a group, if groups can have attitudes, and the object of the liking, disliking. And I will call the object of the liking, disliking the formal object of the liking, disliking. So liking, uh, an attitude is a two-plus relation characterized by its valence, positive, negative, a specific degree, an individual that bears the attitude, and an entity that bears the attitude, and the formal object of the attitude. Now, as you can see here, the formal object of the attitude can be extremely diverse. We can have attitude toward individuals. We can like and dislike Obama. There's actually some research about whether we like and dislike Obama. We can have attitudes toward kinds, old, older people, younger people. We can have uh, black people, white people. We can have attitude toward abstract ideas, liberal ideas, conservative ideas. We also can so have attitude toward brand. A large part of the psychology of attitude actually belongs to consumer psychology, right? Where people study your attitudes toward Mac, toward uh, Microsoft, and so on and so forth. So a very diverse array of formal objects. How do we individuate attitudes? Well, attitudes are distinguished from one another by two properties. First, the valence, whether the attitude is positive and negat or negative, it's a liking or disliking, and the strengths of this liking and disliking. And second, the formal object, what they are about. How do we distinguish attitudes from other two-place psychological relations by attention? Well, attitudes differ from other mental states by a diverse set of properties. The nature of their formal object, the fact that they have a valence, and their functional properties. Right? So everything I've said here is just a background. I'm not going to be challenging that. An attitude just is a liking, disliking. It's not what philosophers mean by a, a propositional attitude. Now, according to mainstream view, within this broad category of attitude, we need to draw a distinction between implicit and explicit attitude. So distinction is, is drawn by looking at two axes that happen to be, by and large, orthogonal to one another. The first axe is automaticity, which roughly is the way the attitude influences your behavior. Right? Whether the influence on your behavior depends on an intention. And introspectability, which is by and large whether or not the attitude, uh, uh, you, have, uh, uh, you have access to it and you can express its content. So I'm going to be assuming with uh, psychology that these two axes are orthogonal to one another. And for the sake of time, I won't try to spell out uh, the, uh, the nature of these two dimensions, but there will be a lot of things to be said about what automaticity really amounts to and what introspectability really amounts to. So with psychology, the way psychologists talk about implicit attitude is that they're very high on automaticity and they're very low on introspectability. Right? By contrast, explicit <coughs> attitudes are very high on introspectability and very low on automaticity. Furthermore, when you ask a social psychologist what kind of things a, uh, attitudes are, both implicit and explicit attitudes, the view, the dominant view, is that they are mental states, right? The right ontological category of attitudes is that of a mental state, right? So what does that really mean to say that attitudes are mental states? Well, there are many ways to try to answer that question. The first way to answer that question is to say, well, look, oops, <laughs> roughly, the ontology is the same one as, and then you give a bunch of examples of mental states, right? You try to explain what it means by giving example. So to say that implicit and explicit attitudes are mental states is to say that the same kind of entities as, for example, desires, beliefs, and, and emotions. That's the first part. Now, it's not very satisfying because you, you want to know, well, what makes beliefs, desires, emotions, mental states? So a bit more should be said. So that's a, as a second part, to, to say that uh, uh, attitudes are mental states is to say two things. To say first that they are the kind of things that can be tokened, they can occur, right? So you can have a type token distinction defined over, over attitudes, right? Uh, beliefs, you have a type, of a type belief and each belief can occur, right? It's localized in time, right? Because they can occur, they can enter in token causal relationship. That's the second property. So to say that, mental st uh, that attitudes are mental states is to say that they are the kind of things that can occur, they can be localized in time, and because they occur, because they're events, they're proper relata of token causal relationship. They can cause, at the token level, other mental states and behavior. 
right? That's what it means to say that they are mental states. To deny that they are mental states is to deny that one of these two conditions hold, or both, obviously. And a third way to go about uh, uh, fleshing out the claim that they're mental state is maybe if you're committed to some kind of view physicalism, for example, or non-reductive physicalism, to say that explicit or implicit attitudes are mental states is to say that each occurrent mental state is identical to a specific physical state, for example, to a, speci to a specific brain state. Right? That could be another way of fleshing out the claim. Now, the picture we get here is that we have two types of mental states, each characterized by its valence and its formal object. Some of them are, are introspectable and are not automatic. They are our explicit attitude. Some of them are automatic and not introspectable. Both are mental states, uh, uh, and they are uh, our, uh, implicit. Attitude. Now, because those ones are not uh, opaque to introspection, what psychologists, what's really the great discovery is not so much the postulation of these mental states, but that kind of work here. The development of a set of new indirect measures meant to give us an assessment of this indirect, uh, uh, of this implicit attitude. Now, it's really going to be important for the remainder of the talk to, to uh, notice that there are actually more than one indirect measure of implicit attitude. In fact, there's many of them, right? Here I just gave, gave you a short list. So implicit association test, Fazio's affective priming, the go-no-go -go test, semantic priming, I, uh, IMP, EAST, and so on and so forth. You have a range of different ways to try to get a strength of the nature, uh, 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 an assessment of the strength of our implicit attitude. Now that picture should in many ways be uh, familiar. It's a very traditional way of thinking about the mind, right? You just put different names, but if you think about it, it's very much the picture we got from Freud. So for Freud, desires are balanced mental states also that have a specific relation to action. So it's not, they're not exactly attitude, but they're in the same ballpark. And for Freud too, we have two types of uh, desires. We've got those that are, uh, uh, we're conscious of, I like my parents, and we've got those, of course, we're quite unconscious of, and it's better for us. I want to have sex with my mother, and I really don't like my father. Uh, now, the relation between the two types of mental states is not the same one in modern cognitive psychology, where it's an architectural distinction, and in Freud, where it's mostly defense mechanisms. But you do have this biparty, this uh, division into two different types of valence mental states. And also, just like modern psychologists, really the great invention of Freud, in addition to this distinction, division of the mind in two, is the development of a set of indirect measures to get one's handle on the nature, uh, on the nature of our unconscious desires. So what Freud did really is develop a set of tools, such as interpretation of dreams, Horschach test here, all of which are meant to tell us the nature of our unconscious desires. Very much like social psychologists have developed new tools, IAT, semantic priming, affective priming, to tell us the nature and strength of our implicit attitudes. Now, you may wonder whether I'm mischaracterizing so social psychologists and philosophers when I say that that's roughly the way they're thinking about the mind. Here are a bunch of quotations for some of our favorite philosophers. Tamar Gendler just starts by saying uh, that a paradigmatic alif, by which she roughly means implicit attitude, is a mental state, and then she goes on. Uriah Kriegel also endorses her way of thinking about implicit attitude. And social psychologists, they're not as explicit af as philosophers, but by and large, when they talk, they talk of retrieving attitude, of attitude being token, for example, a set of concepts that only make sense if they view attitude as being uh, mental states. So what I've been doing here is just fleshing out the picture I'm, I will try to be characterizing, right? So the view, uh, right, attitude, I mean liking, disliking, um, uh, there are mental states. I've tried to flesh out what I mean by a mental state, and I've been arguing it's a very traditional picture. I, I gave you the example of Freud. I could have given you the example of Plato also, right? It's a very old-fashioned, traditional way of thinking about the mind. All right, so that's the view we've been looking at, right? Attitudes are that kind of mental state, beliefs, desires, emotions. That's the wrong way of thinking about the mind. So I will be arguing. So what's the right way of thinking about the mind? Well, the claim is that mental states are the wrong ontology for aptitude. What's the right ontology? Well, there are going to be things like prudence and justice. 
right? They're going to be traits. If you want to think about attitude, think of them as traits rather than mental states. So the first thing I have to do is to explain what a trait is. And I will do that in two different ways. The first thing I will give you a bunch of examples of what I mean by traits. And then I will provide a characterization of what a trait is. So here are a bunch of examples. The big five in personality psychology, each of the big five is the openness to experience, extraversion, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, conscien consciousness, um, uh, conscientiousness, all of them are uh, traits, right? So the big five, if you know a bit that bit of psychology, think of them as traits. Need for cognition, right? Your disposition to uh, dig deeper for intellectual answers. That's also a trait. So traits belong to scientific psychology, but they also belong to folk psychology, right? Honesty is a trait. That's what I mean by trait. Courage is also a trait. Notice some traits have a moral dimension. Honesty is obviously a moral dimension. Not, not all are, not all have, right? The big five don't have any moral dimension, right? So that's kind of example, try to prime your intuition of what I mean by traits. Here's a more uh, abstract characterization, not a definition, but a more abstract characterization of the notion of, of trait. So a trait is a disposition to perceive, attend, cognize, and behave in a particular way in a range of social and non-social situations. Let me comment a bit on that characterization. So traits are dispositions. Right. They're not behavioral dispositions, they're disposition to behave and cognize, right? So they're not simply they're not behavioral dispositions, they also manifest themselves in a specific way to perceive the world, to have emotion, to pay attention to some things rather than others. Right? So the right way to think about traits is in as a disposition. Furthermore, there are broad track dispositions. Right? So there are two ways to conceive of disposition as narrow track disposition. So being breakable is a narrow track disp disposition. Something that's breakable does only one thing, it breaks. Uh, by contrast, broad track disposition are manifested in a range of, of, of different manners, right? And it's sometimes in an open-ended ways. Uh, so the view is that traits are broad track behavioral and cognitive dispositions. So what's characteristic of traits also is that there are individual differences, right? Some of us have more of it, some of us have less of it. And this variation can be measured. So we've got tools that give us somehow a handle on this diversity, right? And this, this variation, so some organi organisms have more of it, others have less of it. And this variation is also predictive of behavior and cognition. Notice that way of thinking about traits makes sense of all the examples I gave you a little bit earlier. Just think of courage, right? So being courageous is a disposition. It manifests itself in your behavior. You may stand in front of a tank if you're extremely courageous, but also in your emotions, right, in your mind. So it's a behavioral and cognitive disposition. It's broad track. It's not defined by a specific behavior. It manifests itself in an, in an array of situations. And it can be measured. Some of us are actually cowards. Some of us are, are extremely courageous. And it has, uh, of course, uh, an impact on, uh, it can be used to predict people's behavior. The same is true of the other traits here. All right, so that's what I mean by, by traits. Now, traits are not mental states, right? So if you, if, if, you're not, if, if you see what I mean by a trait, it should be obvious, traits are not mental states. And the real reason is that traits are not the kind of things that can be tokened, right? Mental states are the kind of things that can stand in token type relation. They occur at a specific time. Traits are not the kind of things that happen at a specific time. Courage does not happen, right? Courage can be manifested, right? It's a disposition, uh, but it does not uh, happen, right? Courage is not localized at a specific time. Um, because uh, uh, traits don't happen, they do not stand in token causal relationships. So traits are not the kind of things that enter in token causal relationships. Traits have a causal significance but at the type of variable level, right? So you can explain why people are more or less courageous. You can explain why people, courageous people do X while uh, cowards do Y. But that's always at the type, at the type level, right? T uh, 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 I think it's a mistake to think of traits as being at the token uh, uh, level. All right, so traits are not mental states. Now, what's the relation between traits and mental states then, if traits are not mental states? Well, let's think about courage. What's the relation between one's courage, a disposition to behave and cognize in a particular way, and 
our mental states. So we can have belief that fear is shameful. We can have some particular emotion, a fear reaction, a pride reaction, a specific strength of self-control. So what relation between courage or disposition and this very complex set of mental states and, ment and psychological mechanisms? Well, what I want to say is that these mental states, psychological mechanisms, determine one's courage, right? So that's just a psychological basis of one's courage. Now, it's quite important to see that the psychological basis is very heterogeneous. It's very diverse. It contains many things. But uh, one's degree of courage is a function of a very complex set of mental states and psychological, uh, and psychological uh, uh, mechanism. And I would call that the psychological basis of uh, one's uh, trait. All right, so that's, that's as a background, to just introduce the notion of trait. Now, the claim that I will be defending in section three is that attitudes are traits. Right? They're not mental states, they are traits. Right? So an attitude is a disposition to behave and cognize, have thoughts, emotion, attend, toward an object in a way that reflects some preference. That's the right, that's the right ontological category to think about attitudes. Of course, attitudes, for example, racism, depend on the kind of mental state one has, right? One's racism, just like one's courage, depends on a very complex set of mental states and psychological processes, right? So one's racism depends on one's belief, one's moral beliefs, for example, on maybe an association between concepts, maybe, maybe on one's emotional reaction, maybe on the strength of one's self-control. Very complex story here to be told that explains one's degree of, of, of racism. But notice racism just isn't part of the mind slash brain, right? It's a, di it's a disposition to attend, to, to, to behave, and to cognize that's determined by a very complex set of mental states and psychological uh, processes. Now, how to think of indirect measures? Indirect measures are things like the implicit asso association test, uh, affective priming, in this framework. So on my view, the IAT or affective priming are going to be indirect measures of one disposition. And they're going to be indirect measures in of one disposition by measuring components of the psychological basis that determines the strength of one trait. So for example, the IAT may, I'm just speculating here, tap into one component of a very complex set. It may just measure the association between concepts, maybe, black and danger. Maybe. But that's only one component of a very complex set of mental states and, and processes that determines one's racism. Affective priming will tap onto another component of the psychological basis of one's trait, maybe of the nature of our emotional, re emotional reactions <coughs> related uh, to, uh, uh, to race. All right, so I hope the picture is clear. I've just, I've, I've just been laying out some, uh, somehow the view. Uh, the, the main notion here was the notion of a trait, spend some time explaining what it is. And the main claim is that attitudes, the right, on the right ontology is that of a trait. Right? They depend, of course, on our mental states, but they're not to be identified with any of the mental states we have. Right? Now, what remains of explicit and implicit attitude in these pictures? Well, I think the implicit versus explicit contrast is defined over mental states. Right? Uh, it's, uh, you know, only mental states can be explicit and implicit because that's the kind of things we have um, um, uh, access to, right? They can be introspectable and also that can have a token relation with behavior. That so they can have an automatic impact on behavior. So the implicit-explicit distinction just does not apply to attitude. So on my view, it's a mistake. It's a conceptual confusion to talk about implicit and explicit attitudes. We may talk about implicit and explicit mental states that determine the strength of our attitude. That's all good. But the attitudes themselves are not well characterized as being implicit and explicit. So what do we do? What's going on really when we say or think for ourselves, I like black people, I'm treating black people as the same way I'm treating uh, white people. What's the nature or function of the speech act, for example? On the traditional picture, it's very simple. They express one attitude. right? What is their function, on my view? Well, they have many functions. One of them is uh, just expressive, right? We express a positive emotional reaction toward a group. I like Mac. I like Apple. I'm just expressing my, 
warm feeling whenever I see my iPad, right? That's one thing I do. Uh, so it's just an expressive function of uh, that kind of speech check. Another one is um, uh, uh, it's a connative function. If I say, I don't, like, I don't like Microsoft, I'm giving you an order, right? Or I'm giving myself, and I'm also giving you an order. You should not buy Microsoft, it's just bad for you, right? So it's a connative function of speech act. A third thing these speech acts do, I like black people, is just an assertion. An assertion of what? What are you asserting? Well, you are measuring, you're expressing an assessment of your own attitude, right? When I say I like black people, what I'm really, what one of the things I'm doing in addition to expressing a positive feeling, to giving me a moral order, is also to uh, measure my attitude, to just express, oh, I have this attitude to that degree. I'm reporting an assessment of the strengths of my attitude. Uh, and how do I report this assessment? Well, I think it's very, it's, it's, I think one idea is that you're asking me, do you like black people? Are you biased? Well, how am I going to answer that question? Well, I'm going to think, I'm going to focus on some components of the psychological basis of my racism. In one context, I may focus on my moral belief. Right? I'm saying, well, I think racism is wrong, so, well, I like black people. But in another context, maybe you, s maybe you ask me, um, oops. Okay, okay so in some of something has disappeared. It doesn't matter. So in one context, I'm going to be focusing in my, in my belief, but maybe in the next context you ask me, but remember, um, Remember last time w it was like midnight and uh, there was these four tall black men uh, in the one side of the street and you saw the right thing to do was obviously to cross the street uh, and walk on the, on the other side walk. Remember? So, well, yes, I remember. Do you like black people? Well, I like black people all right, but uh, I, I'm maybe a little bit biased just like everybody else, right? So how do I make this, uh, this assessment of the strength of my attitude? I, co I examine some components of the psychological basis of my racism, and which one I'm focusing on is very much context sensitive, right? In some contexts, I'm going to be focusing on my moral belief, easily accessible on the top of my head. But if you prime me to think about specific memories or specific emotional reaction, I will give another assessment of my attitude, right? All right. So that's for e explicit attitude. Compare courage, right? Courage is a trait. What do I do when I say I'm very courageous? Well, I do many things. One thing I do is I express a positive feeling toward courage. Another thing I do, I'm giving myself an order. Be courageous, Edward. Don't be a coward. Don't be wicked. And a third thing I do is provide an assessment of the degree of my courage. I'm measuring and I'm reporting to you how courageous I am. So I suggest that we should be treating attitudes the way we treat courage. I am very courageous does not express an attitude. It expresses a belief about the strength of one's attitude, not the attitude itself. Quid of implicit attitude? Well, on that view, there is no such thing as implicit attitude. Again, there's no room for implicit attitude. Attitudes are dispositions to behave and cognize, determined by a complex set of mental states. And there's no need to postulate an implicit attitude in contrast to an explicit attitude. Again, compare. So Calvin says he is an incredibly courageous individual, and he repeats it again and again and again. But you put a snake in front of Calvin, and Calvin runs away. Now, here is the wrong things to say. There is the explicit courage expressed by his speech act, and then there is the implicit courage deep down in his mind, which explains why Calvin is running away. That if you do that, you're just si doing silly psychology, right? Here's a right explanation of Calvin's behavior. Calvin is making speech acts which report the strength of his courage, but Calvin is mistaken. Calvin has a false belief about the strength of his courage. There's no implicit courage. Calvin just is a coward, right? And that is, me, but he has a mistaken view, a mistaken belief about his own courage. We don't need to explain Calvin's behavior to postulate an implicit courage in addition to his explicit courage. That's crazy psychology. I think the same is true of attitudes, right? 
There's no need to postulate an implicit racism, an implicit sexism, in addition to our explicit racism. The right way of describing it is that we're making speech acts, which have many functions, expressive, connative, uh, and also uh, just asserting a judgment about the strengths of our sexism and racism, and we are mistaken. We think we are not racist, but we are racist. We think we are not sexist, but we are a bit sexist, right? Uh, but to explain our behavior, we don't need to postulate two sexisms, two racism, one explicit, one, one implicit. No more than we need to postulate two courageous to explain people's behavior. There's one courage, there's one sexism, and there's one racism. All right, that's a view anyway I wanted to be defend, that I wanted to uh, put forward. So what I've done so far is just contrasting two different ways of thinking about attitude. So dominant way that embraced by nearly everybody, that say, look, their mental states, you have two types of mental states, explicit and implicit mental states. We've seen how they distinguish from one another. They can cause behavior. They know that's a proper type of things to stand in token causal relationships. And the tray picture, that they know their dispositions to behave and cognize. You don't need to postulate implicit attitudes, right? All right. That's the story, as a contrast I wanted to be drawing uh, in the first part of the talk. Now, I owe you some kind of argument I guess, uh, <laughs> uh, to explain why the second view is a better view than the first one, and what I'm going to try to uh, do in uh, uh, the uh, next uh, section. So here's the structure of the argument. So trap picture, so the second view, the view I'm trying to sell you, provides uh, what I think anyway is a compelling, unifying account of a set of otherwise puzzling findings in the literature in on implicit attitudes, right? So if you look at that literature, what you see is a bunch of findings that just really don't make very much sense if you endorse a traditional way of thinking about attitudes. But I will be arguing at least they make some kind of sense if you endorse the trait picture of, of attitudes. All right, an important result, which I think philosophers haven't done nearly enough of, is that if you look at, so the indirect measures, remember, are the kind of tools that have been developed over the last 20 years to get an assessment of the strengths of our alleged implicit attitudes. And I said earlier, look, it's going to play an important role. There are many of them. And there are actually really many of them. Um, now, an important finding, which has been replicated again and again, is that the correlation between all these indirect measures is nearly zero. Basically, they don't correlate with one another. They don't capture the same part of the variance, which is really quite striking. If you think there are these things as implicit attitudes that we get at by different angles. Now, you do predict an upper bound for any correlation between indirect measures due to the noise built within each measure. So that, there must be an upper bound. You, don't, you never expect a perfect correlation between two different measures. But if they're really measuring our implicit attitude, then you would expect at least some correlation between them, but you don't. Uh, don't take my word for it. You can just look at the data. So if you look at uh, so what you have here are correlation between the IAT and priming. And as you can see, none of them is significant and the numbers are between 0 and 0 0.1. So they capture between 0% of the variance and 1% of the variance. Basically, they don't measure the same thing. They don't account for the same part of the variance. Another study here gives you the same type of result as you can see. The, uh, the correlations here are near zero, right? which means, basically, again, these indirect measures are not tapping into the same things. Whatever they are measuring, they're just not measuring the same things. Right? Uh, now, my, oh, my view makes perfect sense. Again, it's quite puzzling on the first view. On the first view, we have this implicit racism, for example. That's in our mind. We've got different ways at getting at it. Uh, we don't expect a perfect correlation given the noise built in every measure, but we do expect some correlation. Why don't, why don't we find it puzzling? It's not like you can tell a story. Well, you can tell a story. But on my view, it makes perfect sense. The psychological basis of racism is an extre extremely complex set of mental states and psychological processes. The indirect measure just happens to be tapping into distinct components of that set. And as a reason, my view does not predict any correlation between the IAT, for example, and affective priming. Right? They're just not measuring the same thing. So why would they correlate at all? So my view just make, makes perfect sense of that finding. The so second result 
is that um, it's true, as I just said, that the measures don't correlate with one another. But there are ways to increase the degree of correlation, right? So one finding is that uh, a phaseous priming, that we, what we've seen earlier, does not correlate with IAT at all. But there are ways to manipulate phaseous priming such that suddenly it starts correlating with the IAT. What is phaseous priming? It's, it's a form of semantic priming. Uh, so you, so you, 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 you see the face and then um, uh, and then you measure latency, I believe, if I remember properly. I didn't review it just before, but it's a, it's a form of priming. Um, now, the traditional priming and the traditional IAT, it's reasonable to believe they tap onto different psychological constructs. Maybe the IAT tap onto association between concepts. Maybe priming has more to do with one's emotion. But the view is that the category-based version of affective priming, the one that correlates with the IAT, What's going on is that suddenly it taps onto the same thing that the IAT is measuring, right? And I think that's the well-received explanation, right? Now, if that's true, then again, my view, by assuming a very complex array of mental states that determines the strength of a racism, explain why you could easily increase the correlation between two measures, right? Just because they're going to tap into distinct components depending on how they're formulated. Right. So again, my view makes some sense of, of that result. Now, a third finding, which again, I think philosophers just haven't made nearly enough of, is the fact that indirect measures just have literally almost no predictive power. Right? They're supposed to be this important discovery uh, that explains well, every ill in our modern society, but the simple fact is that they don't predict anything. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're actually pretty much a useless way of going to, to uh, predict and explain behavior. Uh, so what you have here is it's a positive meta-analysis so by Greenwald, one of the leaders of, uh, one of the like, inventor of uh, the IAT with Banerjee. Uh, and so that's people who basically have developed the IAT. Right? As you can see, uh, the IAT in this positive meta-analysis is capped at, at 0.2. Right, the, the correlation is 0 0.2. 0 0.2 is not nothing. It's not, a, it's not zero correlation, it's a si significant correlation. But it explains 4% of the variance, which means that 96% of the variance in race-related be race behavior, in gender-related behavior here, in other things, 96% of, of the variance is not explained. Now, if you move to critical meta-analysis, like Oswald meta-analysis, the correlation dropped from 0 0.2 to 0 0.1, meaning that IAT explains 1% of the variance in biased behavior. It, it just means basically the IAT explains nothing in, in, in human behavior. It's, it's barely more than noise. Right? It's not noise. It does capture something, but almost nothing. Right? Uh, now, it's really quite puzzling, frankly. Uh, uh, and it's also really puzzling on the traditional picture. Right? Is that supposed to be that mental state, the implicit attitude, which is supposed to have some, some complex relation with behavior? We try to measure it by these tools, and then our measures don't correlate with behavior. Well, what's, what's going on? Well, again, on my view, it's just perfectly normal. That's exactly what you would be expecting. So the IAT measure one component of a very complex set of mental processes all of which are what determines the strengths of our attitude, right? So we would not be expecting the IAT to be a good measure of our racism because our racism is determined by all these mental states, right? Uh, uh, and the IAT tap into one of uh, many, uh, uh, one of many mental states and psychological processes that explain behavior. Right? A fourth measure um, uh, is that. Um, one can increase the correlation between indirect and direct measures. Right? So in, some con in most contexts, um, um, so one of the usual findings is, as you know, is that people's explicit report don't correlate very well with their uh, score on the IAT. Right? You say, I'm not biased, but then you do the IAT and you find to your own shock that you actually you do have a negative bias so to speak, anyway, against uh, various, various groups. But it's also important to, to, to know that you can easily bump up uh, this correlation, right? And you can actually bump up to a very respectable 
very respectable degree, right? So usually the correlation is between 0 0.1, 0 0.2. So again, very, very low correlation between the direct and indirect measures. But you can bump up the correlation to uh, 0.6, uh, so we, a, a substantial uh, measure. Again, a little bit puzzling on the traditional okay, picture. How do you bump it up? You ask people to focus on their emotions? <laughs> you know, you just say, uh, uh, instead of asking, do you like black people, you just say, well, remember the last time you interacted with the black people in the dark, and uh, what were your emotions? And then suddenly you, your report correlates with, your, uh, 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 with what's measured by uh, some of the indirect measures. Not all, but some of them. Uh, you basically just ask people to focus on the right thing. Uh, and again, that's really puzzling on, on the usual picture. We've got these two mental states that are supposed to be fairly independent from one another, indirect and explicit attitude. They're supposed to expect complementary part of the variance. So we would not expect that suddenly the measures of these two mental states would be, in some contexts, not correlated, in other contexts, correlated. Again, that's really a puzzling finding on the traditional picture. Makes perfect sense of mine on my picture. In one context, we're going to fo be focusing on I think in many contexts, we're going to be focusing on what's easily accessible when we ask, do you like black people? For example, our normative beliefs about race relations. But in other contexts, we're going to be, sorry, in other contexts, we're going to be focusing on our emotional reaction. And when we focus on our emotional reaction to make that judgment, we're going to be having a high correlation between the indirect measure, which happens to be tapping into the same construct, and whatever of our mental states we use to make this uh, speech act. So again, my picture just makes a perfect sense of the fact that it's easy to bump up the correlation between indirect measure and uh, direct measure of, of, of attitude. And the last finding I wanted to uh, mention that some of you probably all know that uh, important result, is that uh, it's extremely, so the automatic assessment, so the indirect measure of our biases is extremely context sensitive, right? Uh, it's not true that we are biased uh, by the IAT. That's actually just a completely mischaracterization of the literature. It's true that we are biased when we take it in one context. Take it in another context, your bias will actually disappear. So if you want to be biased, Listen to, uh, if you don't want to be biased, I should say, because nobody really wants to be biased. Uh, if you don't want to be biased, don't listen to hip hop before taking the IAT. That's just not a good way to get a good <laughs> IAT store. Uh, don't think about gang. Uh, if you think about gang before taking the IAT, you're going to, you're going to come across bias. But if you think about barbecuing, that's going, you're much less likely to actually have a biased IAT. Uh, if you think about a uh, say white serial killer, that's going to improve your IAT quite a lot. Uh, if you think about admired black people, it's going to improve your IAT quite a lot. Actually, you may even have a, have a preference for black people. Uh, if you want not to be biased against women, think about philosophers you really admire, like Nancy Cartwright. Uh, and, and somehow your, bi your uh, alleged bias against women, as measured by the IAT, will uh, disappear. A useful piece of advice if you do the IAT at night is that don't do the IAT at night. Uh, if, you do, uh, <laughs> if you do the IAT in a, dark, in a dark room, you're going to come across as a biased, as a biased individual. Uh, do it full light, you know, uh, that's going to help you, and so on and so forth. I mean, so the simple truth is that it's just mischaracterizing the psychology to say that the IAT has shown that people are biased. No, in some contexts we get a biased IAT, in other contexts we don't. That's the right way of describing the psychology. Uh, and again, the claim here, it's not that the traditional picture can't make sense of contextual variation. Of course it can make sense of contextual variation. It can say, for example, look, the implicit attitude is contextual, right? It, it's, its strength is going to be, uh, uh, to vary, uh, or it's going to be accessed depending on various contextual factors. So it can make sense of contextual variation in principle. What it's really lacking is a tool to explain the specific form of contextual variation. Because it's postulating a novel psychological construct, implicit attitude, about which we don't have any, very much, we don't have very much of a theory to make sense of that construct. So it does not explain why darkness would bump up our, our uh, 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 implicit attitude score. By contrast, the tree picture ma makes perfect sense of not all, but at least as the resources to make sense of that result. Why? Well, we know, for example, that uh, uh, in darkness, our startle reflex 
is actually increased and we are more likely to have peer reaction, right? So we, more li we actually have a high heightened um, uh, negative effect in uh, darkness, right? So if we assume, for example, that affective priming taps into our emotional reaction or things, things connected to our startle reflex, right? We can expect why affective priming would be heightened in, in darkness, right? Because the in on the tray picture, we are using most good old fashioned psychological constructs for which we do have existing theories that explain what modulates, what moderates their occurrences. We can make sense of the actual variation, the actual context sensitivity that we find in uh, social psychological studies. Not so on the uh, mental state picture. All right, that was the argument. I just, I just laid out a bunch of findings. It's not like the, the traditional picture could make sense of them. It could make sense of them, right? For each of them, there's a story to be told on behalf of the traditional picture. I'm not denying that, right? But what's interesting is that the story would be probably different for all each of these five findings, right? And I think you know, there would be an air of ad, hoc ad hocity for uh, the traditional picture. On my view, we have at least a unifying, not, a f not, not in great detail, you know, I, I'm just laying out here some, some basic idea, but we have a unifying account of findings, which at the very least we should find puzzling if we endorse a traditional picture of, of attitude. All right, so I have five minutes, so I can uh, uh, deal with some of the objection and responses. Um, and maybe I'll just do one, okay. Uh, one which may have crossed your mind or may not. So I've been using the notion of trade. Um, I, I don't know how much you know about the history of social psychology, but the notion of trade, of course, is not my notion. So very long history in social psychology. Alport was one of the developers of that notion now more than 60 years ago. So it's, you know, it's, it's an important uh, notion. And of course, trade psychology has been intensely debated over the last 50 years in social psychology. It's actually one of the most controversial notions within social psychology. So one may be a bit puzzled by uh, my appeal to that notion given, that given its checkered history, given that most people think there's no such thing as trait. And in fact, there's a long tradition both in uh, psychology, that's of course a classic textbook, Ross and his bed, the person and the situation, and in the philosophy of psychology, John Dury's wonderful lack of characters book, that argue that in fact, human beings don't have anything like broad track traits. Well, we may have narrow track traits, maybe context sensitive, context specific behavioral disposition, but we don't have this very broad track uh, behavioral disposition. We don't have any traits according to that uh, uh, tradition. So that's a little bit unfortunate, some may think, to appeal to that notion given that probably we don't have <laughs> any trait in our mind. Uh, we don't have any trait to explain human behavior. Now it turns out that, I mean, I, I really like Doris and I'm, I'm a big fan of Nisbet, but I think they're wrong. Uh, I do think actually uh, traits uh, are actually a, a useful construct to do our psychology. Traits are actually predictive of human behavior. So a trait is not predictive of a specific occurrent behavior. So your degree of courage does not tell me how you behave on a specific instance. Um, but what it tells me is that if I aggregate across instances, the degree, your degree of courage will allow me to predict your behavior in the aggregate, right? So traits are extremely good actually at predicting behavior in the aggregate. When you aggregate across situations, right, traditional traits in psychology uh, actually have a very high predictive power. So I think the mistake of uh, the situationist literature uh, of Nisbet and, and colleagues and also of John Durris is actually to think that traits should predict specific occurrences of behavior. They don't, or very, very, very poorly. But if you think that traits must be predicting behaviors in the aggregate, they actually are extremely predictive. It's a classic argument back from the 1980s. Epstein is a guy who made that argument in a bunch of papers. It's a compelling, it's a compel in my view, a compelling argument. Right? And in any case, the problem is not specific to attitudes conceived as traits. Right? If your main reason to reject traits is that they don't predict behavior, that problem also generalizes to attitude as mental states. So uh, you know, is that a real problem for my view? It's also a real problem for the other view. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not in such a bad uh, situation. All right, so that, that was the first uh, uh, question. 
the first objection. I leave the other ones maybe for the q and A. I I just want to uh, be concluding. Uh, so what I want to be arguing is that, uh, what I've been arguing is that if you think uh, about things like racism, like sexism, but also all the attitudes we could be interested in, or attitude toward Obama, or attitudes in consumer psychology toward brands, or attitude toward ideas, all that kind of thing, it's a mistake to think that they are somehow in the head. They just aren't in the head. Right? Attitudes aren't the kind of things that happened as mental states. They, they don't happen, they don't stand in token causal relationship. Attitudes such as racism, their behavioral and cognitive dispositions, they're determined by a very complex set of uh, mental states, right? Uh, but they're just not one of these mental states. And our speech acts, um, and they do many things, they express our positive uh, uh, emotions, they gi we give orders to ourselves, and they're also just simple ways of reporting our judgment and often study our mistaken judgment about uh, the strength of our attitude. Right. If you're interested, there's one day maybe uh, a paper coming in that volume that will be maybe one day published uh, if the editor puts the act together. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, thank you for your attention.